Hello, everybody, and welcome to the number one generative AI podcast in the world. So today we have a very special episode with Sean and I, you get us, just the two of us, but uh, we did something kind of interesting this week. So on Wednesday, it was uh, earlier this week. So for reference, today is February 10th, 2024. Uh, so I think that would have been, what, February 7th? Mm-hmm. Uh, February 7th. We went to Palo Alto to see the top 500 startups. So there is a, or I, I, I guess you wouldn't call it the top 500 startups, but there is the 500 startups investment community. And uh, we saw their pitch day. So we saw oh, a... Actually, it was, uh, it was more of a practice session. Oh, okay. So it was the preview day. For the 500 startups accelerators uh, batch 34, so every year um, they have a couple batches. I think they have two batches in summer, winter, I think, where they select a bunch of companies to bring into their accelerator or incubator, where they give them mentorship and some seed funding, and help them refine their idea, find product market fit, find customers, and most importantly, refine their pitch to find investors on the demo day. So I believe the demo day is next month in March, but uh, this was a preview of that day to help them refine their pitch and uh, demo their products in front of a you know more friendly audience of uh, friends and family, other batch members and uh, investors that are in the 500 community. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we went there and we watched a bunch of pitches and we wanted to take this podcast episode today to share with you some of the companies that we saw and uh, how it relates to generative AI. So Shashank, you have a bunch of companies that you're going to explain. So for reference, I came late, so I missed half the companies and uh, Shashank is going to introduce them to me, explain it, and we're going to talk about it. That's right. So let's start from the beginning. So I think there were about 30 companies in the batch in total. Unfortunately, not everyone presented as uh, these are companies that are all over the world. Some of them fly in to come in person here. Some of them can't make it. And out of those, there were a couple that were not based on generative AI. So we have about 10 companies here that we think, that we think make sense to talk about uh, with you guys, the audience. And the first one is an ed tech startup. They're called Co-Teach, co-teach.io. And uh, we've seen a lot of interest in ed tech with generative AI because uh, the promise is you can build a truly customized learning plan for each individual student as opposed to what we do today where we get the same lesson plan to everyone and the weakest students are kind of left behind and the strongest students kind of get bored and uh, also in some ways left behind. So this one is able to, I guess their pitch was one-on-one teaching uh, for every student where they build a learning plan um, for various subjects, um, which are aligned with the state and common core curriculum powered by AI. And uh, it's a step-by-step solution with images, voice, and animated text, which is really easy for students to understand. And they're available 24-7, which is like an automated and you know, the best tutors that you can have because it's always there whenever the student is ready to learn. Yeah, what what do you think, Mark? So I think that's uh, a really interesting uh, idea uh, to have a separate lesson plan made for each student uh, as opposed to, like you mentioned, having one where every single student is going to have it today. Um, I do kind of wonder, though, uh, if that idea will will take off. I think it's a really interesting idea if you know what you want to learn. But I think that there is uh, oftentimes uh, the issue of not knowing what you don't know uh, in a sense. Mm-hmm. So like hypothetically, let, let's take a subject that I know nothing about, right? Like I know nothing about uh, deep sea diving, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I just, I, I don't really, I don't know anything about it, right? Um, I know you have to hold your breath. You have to go underwater, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that like a lot of nuance that I have nothing about. You probably don't hold your breath if you're deep sea diving. You have a tank where you're constantly breathing. Uh, You know, (laughs) there there, there, we go, right? So like this is the kind of stuff that I don't know about. And like I could say, give me 
like a course on like diving mm -hmm. but like i might not know like what questions to ask mm -hmm. so i think like when you uh put the impetus on the like maybe the parent or like the teacher or the learner uh to ask what they want a course about like they may not know like what actually exists out there mm -hmm. and uh they may ask for like shallow things so i think that like if you know the type of subject matter that you want to learn about like that might be really great because it could be tailored to you but for discovering new things i think that there may be something lacking there but awesome idea yeah so uh i think discovery is definitely a big challenge with uh ai in general as uh i worked with the google assistant a while back and it's, it was always difficult to surface what the assistant was capable of so on the smart displays we introduced these little suggestion chips that you can tap on um that have excuse me uh common interactions that uh, people might be interested in so i think these um these people take a similar approach where they have a bunch of uh chips that are floating around math geometry i guess they're mostly focused on math measurements number system trigonometry and you can uh, upload pictures of your homework, ask it to help. You can click on specific areas within maths where it can give you guided courses. And I think they're trying to focus on a specific curriculum for a given state and a specific grade. So it's not as open-ended as uh, you're, you're, what you're thinking of. And I also met uh, another person working on ed tech. It was a PM at another startup who came to our meetup and she mentioned that um, the biggest challenge is trying to get these products into the school system. That's the entity that you're selling to. And whether or not the student or the parent enjoys this tool, th there are even uh, a lot of teachers who love this tool because it makes it their job simpler, uh, but it's, it's getting the school system to adopt these tools and pay for it and incorporate it into their routine, which is to the challenge. See, yeah, it does seem like that is interesting, but it really could potentially help a lot of students uh, get a course that is tailored to them. So maybe the way I could think about it, if maybe they want you to think about it this way, is like it's kind of like a private tutor mm -hmm. where you kind of know like the general subject matter that you want, mm -hmm. but it can tailor uh the lesson planned for a individual student because i think you know one problem is is as you mentioned if a teacher has to teach for let's say 30 students at a time mm -hmm. like you can't uh tailor the course for a single student mm -hmm. like you have to do it for the average student or the lowest common denominator student or whatever it is but this could be like one teacher per student mm -hmm. and then maybe uh the actual parent or not parent but a uh, teacher child ratio might matter less mm -hmm. because if you could have larger this as yeah huge class sizes like you could have one teacher or like one monitor in the future one person just kind of you know watching the students make sure they don't hurt themselves <laughs> and uh you could just have like a room of a thousand kids all with this this uh individual ai tutor learning them or helping them learn that's a bit of a scary image but uh, I, I guess uh, it would help us scale education to more people it would yeah i, I mean i don't know it's a little bit brave new world <laughs> <laughs> but that, that could be that could be a future um maybe in this current present i think uh it would still help families get access to tutoring services at a much lower cost that's true i'm all for bringing more accessible education to the masses. So another one that we saw is uh, kind of slightly related. It is emotional and social educational learning. So this company is called Nookly, N-O-O-K-L-Y.com. And uh, it allows you to, I guess it's a, it allows you to enter a free form prompt, but uh, their pitch was to give you social skills and build EQ which is not focused on as much in today's education systems. I feel like it's not really focused on much at all. I mean, nowadays, I, or at least when I was in school, I think there was some of that, right? But I think it was more about like, you know, what you knew and not like your emotional intelligence. Did you guys not have a, 
So I went to school, well, in the Middle East, but uh, it was the Indian education system. It's called the CBSE, Central Board of um, Secondary Education. So that was the final exam that we all took in the 10th and then again in the 12th grade. But we had this class, moral science fluff course, where <laughs> I didn't really learn much, but I think its purpose was to give social empathy and uh, emotional understanding, awareness, and teach you to be a good human being. It was like, you know, uh, find a wallet on the floor with a bunch of money. What do you do? A bunch of <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Did, did you guys not have any classes like that in here? Yeah. You know, so we did. Um, I actually went to uh, like a religious school, like a Catholic school. So they had a, a theology course mm-hmm. and like a religious course where they talked about all kinds of stuff. Right. But I don't know if like public school like here would have that maybe they do i'm not sure so that's that's a good question but i don't know i feel like some of that is best uh done by the parents Mm -hmm. potentially right like not necessarily in school Mm -hmm. is the thing they should teach you but that should be like parents teaching good moral values Mm -hmm. uh to to people and also just like social norms Mm -hmm. right like you know it's not good social norms to uh, well, I don't know, like change your clothes in the middle of the classroom. That would be, that would be frowned upon. That, that would be frowned upon. Right. And, uh, I think if you started doing that, people would probably tell you to stop. Yeah. I think, uh, the search discovery is another important conversation here. It's like a, they have an open ended, uh, search box. And I think if you give a couple suggested topics to learn about, that would be kind of helpful. Um, but uh, I tried out that product real quick and uh, it gives you pictures and text and plays out this uh, story to help you learn a specific skill. So I put in a hypothetical skill for a five-year-old kid to make it whimsical. You were able to pick the, the ethnicity, set the kid's name, gender, and the length of the story. And so I said, uh, so I have this kid and uh, she has trouble sharing toys with her brother. How do you how do you solve that? So I built out this hypothetical story where uh, there's a unicorn that comes in. Uh, these are uh, pictures that look kind of like uh, Pixar cartoons. And the unicorn says you can only get this special prize if you work together with uh, someone to solve this puzzle. He works with her brother and you know they face some challenges. They finally solve it and then voila, they're transported into this magical land, a bunch of magical creatures. It was really cute. Uh, I think uh, it's pretty easy to uh, give this to a little kid because you said, uh, well, this is the parent's job. Yes, I think ideally, but kids today are also addicted to their phones and it's hard for them to, or hard for parents to compete with a screen that has all the world's information. That's true. It's hard for anybody to compete with that. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. The next one was yellowpad.ai. So this was started by another Googler. Uh, and it's funny because uh, we worked on the same projects. So he, um, this is a legal startup that automates legal workflows with AI. Did you work with him? No, I, I, I didn't. So I, I'm an engineer. Uh, and he was, he was a lawyer uh, for a long time. But I think at Google, he worked on BizDev. So he worked on Stadia and uh, the Google Home. Oh, nice. So I, I worked on both of those products in addition to a bunch of uh, Home and Nest products. And uh, it was funny. Uh, he left right before Stadia launched. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago. By the way, how long was Stadia released for? Was that like two months or something like that? And they cut, killed it? It was like, oh, yeah, we're going to support this forever. And then after like, you know, a year, they are like, all right, bye-bye. I don't know if they made any promises of uh, how long they'll support this for, but yeah, it didn't last uh, last too long. Wow. Uh, I don't think it aligned with their core business competency. Oh, okay. They were focused on building platforms and uh, infrastructure to empower other developers. I see. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, these guys, yellowpad.ai. I'm excited about uh, legal automation because it seems like um, most of what you pay a lawyer for uh, can be automated. Like you, some of these lawyers charge a thousand dollars an hour 
man, what are you, what, what are they doing? They're spending their time emailing you and responding to phone calls. Um, I, I would love for them to be able to use these automated tools for grunt work or things that they don't need to think too hard about. So maybe they can bill you less hours potentially. Cause I mean, yeah. I feel like with the lawyers, um, you're not just charging, they're not charging you just to, you know, answer a phone call or respond to email. It's not, you're not ty- uh, paying them as a typist. Um, you're, you care. I don't want to, but I, I think I am, but like <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're paying them for what they said. Yep. Um, and uh, making sure that what they said is like legal and the advice is good. So um, I think that something like this is a really cool idea. Um, if it can help the lawyer uh, maybe bill you less hours in aggregate, mm-hmm. right? So like if we can just, if they have some templates that they're working off of, I think that's uh, fantastic. Uh, as long as uh, they can avoid uh, saying anything that is incorrect. Because I know that a lot of these models have hallucination. Yeah. And uh, I'd be worried. And because like, I think a lot of the the nuances for each of the words really, really matter. Um, like uh, whatever you say, like every single tiny detail may be scrutinized in the contract. So well, I think it's like a, a good idea, I... I would be a little bit worried about hallucinations and um, like saying something that's like slightly off that isn't going to be give me the best deal that maybe like a uh, like a lawyer that would have written by hand might have given for a contract or something. Yeah. Um, there was that uh, highly publicized case where a lawyer used the output from ChatGPT verbatim and uh, presented it in court, and I think he got disbarred because. Uh, ChatGPT hallucinated a couple of things that didn't exist in that case. Um, so we definitely, I think uh, uh, lawyers definitely don't want that to happen. Uh, but we've also, um, as part of our meetup event, we host uh, once a month at Procopio Law Offices. And uh, Roger there, uh, who's one of, uh, one of the lawyers there, he mentioned some of his concerns over giving a tool like this to a uh, junior attorney, paralegal, someone, and them not being able to vet the output of these products and just going with whatever it gives them. Um, So he's a little worried about that. You know, that's a really good point because, as I mentioned before, you don't know what you don't know. And if it sounds coherent (laughs) and good, you might be like, yeah, sounds (laughs) sounds fantastic. And uh, I I, I do think... um, Setting that aside, there's a lot of parts of a uh, lawyer's workflow that seems very tedious. Um, yeah. It seems like uh, just s- collecting documents, summarizing what exists, um, and hopefully this can help automate some of that. Yeah, I, I think that's, if it works well, and I assume that if they're making a company out of it, they must have these things. Yeah, and uh, the founder is a, has been a lawyer for many years. So, so it is exciting. Uh, I hope that they've been able to solve a lot of those problems with the hallucinations yeah. and that it works and then lawyers can feel like they trust it. And then maybe uh, lawyers will only be needed for highly complex cases and less of the grunt work. So maybe like uh, if I want something like, I don't know, um, like a will or um, like a company formation, something like that that's like fairly standard, mm-hmm. uh, they might just be able to do that or even like use an automated tool for that going forward and then like you might not even need a lawyer or maybe you just have like a lawyer just like you know check it over Mm -hmm. um and give like the final uh, plus one like okay this is legit and uh maybe that's only need like an hour of their time as opposed to like eight hours or you know 40 hours drafting up documents from scratch yeah, there's definitely a, a hot space for generative AI to be used. Uh, another popular one that comes to mind is uh, Case Text. They've been around for a while. Okay, I mean, what do they do? Is it the same thing? Um, legal services. I think it uh, simplifies the lawyer's work. Yeah, I remember. I think that there was uh, something where they could negotiate traffic tickets or something on your behalf. Um, okay. <laughs> remember the name of that but i do remember seeing something along those lines where you got like a 
parking ticket or something mm -hmm. they could help negotiate that the price down mm -hmm. yeah i guess uh there this those are kind of two um ways you can go with uh generative ai and law you can focus on one specific kind of legal issues you yeah. know parking tickets and then just have a bot fill out the documents for that specific use case or you can build a tool that is more universal that all lawyers can use so i'm just looking at case decks and apparently it's part of uh thomson reuters i guess they bought it um so it's basically a rag from what the demo looks on their website where you throw in a bunch of documents and then you can ask legal questions on those documents that's well, pretty cool yeah um Another one that is kind of related, uh, which I really, you know, thought was really exciting is Immigram.io. Uh, it's an immigration um, help service, which automatically fills out immigration documents. Oh, man, that's fantastic. Oh, my God. You, you have no idea. I do have an idea. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Uh, so my, uh, my wife, she's Japanese. Uh -huh. And uh, when we were applying for a green card, we had to fill out a bunch of documents. And when I say we, I mean me, filled out a bunch of documents for uh, her on USCIS to come here. And like, it was fine, um, but I had to spend a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. uh, filling out like all the documents. You have to like prove that you guys are like actually married. You have to like show pictures of the relationship and uh, you have to show your cold work history, all the countries you've been to, the, all the addresses you've ever lived at. They want to know everything. And while it was approved, there was a lot of tedious effort that would have been really nice. That could have uh, been automated slightly by uh, the AI. And then the same thing happened. Well, I didn't fill it out, but my wife, she filled it out when I was living in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, every time we won, get like a visa for that, mm -hmm. uh, we had to, you know, fill all that stuff. And all that's in Japanese. So mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't have done it. So I needed her help to do it. So like, you know, I'm familiar with like some of this immigration stuff yeah. and it is not fun. So anything there that can be automated is a huge one in my book, especially if it, you know, is going to work, right? Like, because uh, I think... Um, I talked to the one uh, founder, co-founder of Immigrant, and she said that it was like a, like 90-something percent of their applications are approved. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the exact percentage, but I remember it was like quite high. So mm -hmm. if that continues to be true, um, then that's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like what you said was uh, the same thing that I experienced, but on top of that, it, it, on top of the tedium, the bureaucracy, you also have the added emotional stress because as an outsider, you know, you, there's, there's a lot at stake. And I think these big decisions that impact your entire life, uh, whether it's immigration, finance, um, legal issues, you're you're like very emotionally crippled by these forms. So I think it was great that uh, you were there to help out Aya when uh, she was immigrating here and she was there to help you both with like the context of Japanese immigration intricacies and the language. I think that's really nice. But unfortunately, not everyone has someone else to <laughs> help them out. And a tool like this is fantastic. So it seems like they've started off in uh, Europe where there's a ton of immigration, lots of different countries, uh, lots of migration across borders. Um, oh, yeah. Europe sounds hard. Uh, I, guess, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I imagine. Uh, I mean, I think America is pretty hard, too. Well. Uh, I, I think the combination of countries that you can immigrate to and from in Europe may be much uh, more complicated, um, but the process is, I think, one of the hardest here in America. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I love what they're doing. Anything to make immigration simpler is a win in my books. Yeah, totally agree. So Shashank, what's next? Next, we have something kind of adjacent is bookkeeping tax filing for startups uh it's called apla apla hub.com a-p-l-a-h-u-b.com they so the pitch that they made was everyone tries to pay for quickbooks uh but no one actually uses it they just hand it off to their <laughs> tax accountant and said okay here uh, try to make sense of this for me uh, and, you know i 
may agree with them if I had my own business and was doing my own itemized deductions and trying to fill like out. That. That. Yeah, that seems really tedious and really daunting. And also what you don't know, you don't know. Uh, and there's a lot of that when trying to deal with this stuff. So they make it simpler to um, file taxes, do bookkeeping uh, as a startup where they hook up with QuickBooks, book into QuickBooks, Gusto, and Slack, I guess, where you're able to chat with their AI assistant and uh, simplify this process. Yeah, I think that's super interesting um, because I know that accountants can do a lot of grunt work uh, where they're doing things like categorizing expenses and uh, I don't know, like just transposing data from various different receipt types onto uh, different uh, bookkeeping ledgers or whatever. And uh, if that can be automated, I don't know if it'll be completely automated just because I'm sure that they'll want somebody to maybe double check the work. But there's a big difference between double checking what the AI has done and actually having to manually type in the data. So mm. um, it might be able to take you know, some maybe somebody who is spending 40 hours a week on it, they might be able to spend like maybe four hours a week mm -hmm. on and doing that, which is a huge win. So uh, maybe that means that there's less accountants hired, but I think that a lot of the accountants might be overworked anyways. So they can probably use all the help they can get. Yeah. Do you think uh, accountants themselves will start using these tools and charging less for the same routine tasks? Um, maybe. Um, so I, I think that there's different types of things that accountants uh, could potentially do, right? So like uh, my understanding is that, you know, a, so a CPA, they might do something where they uh, do something where you are, what it, but it's like helping people optimize tax. And that I think might be less routine, right? But if you are doing something where you are maybe creating a... Uh, profit and loss statement for a company uh, or preparing a financial statement, some of that may be more uh, routine uh, type work because it's mostly just like categorizing uh, expenses and lumping that together and trying to figure out it's like, you know, it's like money coming in or money going out, right? So that might be more automated, but I think that like, you know, every single year, uh, like different countries they change their tax laws mm -hmm. so based off of uh the different tax laws and accounting treatments that you need to do you need to update your systems every year um so i think because of that like accountants are gonna stay busy now uh, for a while but on but like a lot of the stuff that like was manual uh maybe a lot of that will be uh, fully automated and then you know Maybe in the future, like if everything is on some sort of blockchain, then maybe like the uh, you need just like one programmer to update all the the accounting rules uh, to take out the taxes immediately mm -hmm. off of you know Fed Now or whatever they use, like the, some central bank digital currency. But until we get to that point, um, I think accountants are gonna still have a job, and uh, this will probably just help accelerate what they're doing. Yeah, I guess going back to the analogy of uh, the legal firms that we were looking at, so you can either build products that uh, solve a specific problem for the customer themselves or build tools for the lawyer or tax um, accountant um, and simplify their workflow. I'm curious to see if there's any uh, products that cater to tax accountants. Um, what about Aya? Does she use any AI tools? Yeah, so uh, I, as my wife, uh, she is a CPA, so I know some of this stuff, uh, or I, I don't know it, but she talks about it. So uh, I think she uses some tools that aren't necessarily uh, generative AI. Um, I know she told me that she uses like bill.com, mm. which I think has some good domain. It is great, great domain. Yeah. It uses, and I, I think she also uses like 1099 dot com or something like that so anyway some of these different tools and uh I, I think i don't actually know like all the the things that she uses tools for mm -hmm. but i think um like bill.com has some uh things that you can like maybe uh, 
extract some data from receipts and like maybe some automated bucket. I'm not sure. I don't, I've never used it, but I think she does use all those tools, but I think, you know, there's always things that you might be able to use. You know, there's always room for improvement. So I don't know. I mean, I would imagine these companies, if they're not already using AI or thinking about how to use AI in their work. Yeah. All right. Next one is chat simple chat simple dot AI. It is a chat bot for sales and support. 24 seven lead generation, qualification and conversion, engage and understand the needs of your visitor. And then powered by chat GPT in multiple languages. Um, so their UI is very similar to intercom where there's a little chat bubble on the corner of the website, um, pops up and you can start asking the chat about the website. Um, and, uh, he, the person that I spoke to, um, is founder, one of the founders. Uh, he's also a former Googler. Um, he worked on some of the assistance dialogue flow back in the day before it was LLM powered. Uh, who is not from Google? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a big company uh, and Silicon Valley is a small world. That's true. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination between the startup world and big tech companies. So he worked on some of these early generation of uh, chatbots. Manually, manually have to um, create these conversational flows. And I did that at my early startup many, many years ago. Uh, it's very tedious, uh, very cumbersome, but obviously AI makes things a lot simpler, LLM in particular. Um, and so his pitch was, if you think about a very complicated enterprise software product uh, or company specifically, they have tons and tons of products, features, with uh, highly nested dropdowns with different uh, tools that do all sorts of things. But you as a customer, you go in with a specific problem in mind that you're trying to solve for your company, product, idea, whatever. And it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, look at uh, AWS's website. Oh, my God. Uh, to try to figure out how to host a website, how to deploy a service, how to use a database, there are so, so many options. Um, and if you're an individual, a startup, I think it's very overwhelming. Uh, so this aims to make that process simpler by guiding the users, trying to focus on solving their specific need. So how does that work? W would it be like if I'm a company, I would maybe show my documentation or maybe some chat history or maybe even show, uh, explain like the details of my product and or service and then this would be like a helpful assistant to help you use uh, or better understand uh, a given product. So maybe like it would help automate some of the uh, customer support and sales roles. Is that like the way to think about this? Um, I guess the onboarding flow specifically. So they, s they have a, a demo on their website. It's, it says all it takes is five minutes to create the perfect AI chatbot for your business. And there's a video of it, uh, uh, where you input a bunch of links, um, and customize, you know, the chat window according to your brand, add a logo, set a color scheme. Um, and once it has uh, scraped all of the links for your website, uh, it can just ingest all that data. I assume on the back end, it kind of builds a rag where it has um, a knowledge base of all of your company's data. And then you can ask a question. Okay. I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, so maybe it could help uh, with selling your product. Mm -hmm. So people might have questions about it. They might not know what to, what to do, mm -hmm. um, why to buy, and this could help you. As opposed to have paying somebody to answer those questions manually mm -hmm. uh, or like having a detailed FIQ, like people just ask, tell me what this product does. Mm -hmm. I need help. Yeah, it's a cool idea. Yeah, they've uh, added some more features um, where you can surface certain actions that you want customers to take talked about discoverability with these uh, AI chat box being difficult. So you can have like a buy button um, or um, browse button for a specific feature and make it easier for users to discover that. All right. Next is Vidoc Security. 
V-I-D-O-C, security.com. Vindoc. Vindoc. Vind, vind doc? Maybe vind, vind doc. Vind doc. I don't think it has anything to do with, with video. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, I met uh, one of the folks working on it. I think he might be the founder. Um, this really sweet uh, Polish guy who, you know, I saw his uh, blog post on uh, LinkedIn. Um, he said he moved from Poland, left his family, his cat behind, and uh, he's here with his girlfriend. Uh, he's very supportive. And he is like, you know, I, I took a big leap of faith, uh, moved out here uh, halfway across the world. You know, I don't have any FANG degree, uh, not from many of the Ivy League schools, but, you know, I'm trying. Um, you know, Poland is a wonderful place. It'd be hard to leave. <laughs> Uh, but one thing he had going for him is uh, he had, so this is a cybersecurity or AI security engineer that automates um, AI generated, uh, sorry, automates threat detection, uh, finds vulnerabilities, security holes in your code base. Um, and the way they landed on this idea was uh, they'd been collecting bounties for um, white hacking challenges from various companies, Microsoft, uh, that's the one that I remember, but I think uh, a couple other companies too, Meta. Um, so where they discovered vulnerabilities, uh, got a bunch of prizes, and then they realized, hey, maybe we can automate this process. Uh, build a tool that finds vulnerabilities uh, in your code base um, and helps you protect against them. He showed me the tool. Uh, it was really well built. It has a bunch of different modules that apparently people from the community have created that can find um, various security issues. Um, uh, they're targeting web applications right now. As uh, he mentioned that uh, mobile apps have slightly different workflow for detecting security holes, and that's a crowded space already. Yeah, because I, I know that um, a lot of, well, it depending on the type of application, like I, I think like your threat model is different. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're building, uh, let's say an Android application, an Android application, uh, there are, I think, less security vulnerabilities to worry about compared to uh, if you're building a web server. Uh, because, you know, for an Android app, you're only running, you're running locally on the device. Uh, only one user is using it at a time. Uh, like the, I mean, in general, you don't have to worry about like a whole lot of things. The only thing you have to really worry about is like maybe other apps and then user input, right? Uh, but don't have to worry about other apps. It's like a siloed environment. Well, if you're doing some sort of inter-process communication between the applications, you might need to hypothetically worry about the app if you are, uh, you know, allowing input from another app. But that's like kind of a niche use case. Um, but like if you have a web server, then you're getting uh, potentially user input from maybe millions or billions of users all at a time. So, well, if you're getting billions of users, you probably build out your own thing. Well, I mean, that's a good problem to have, right? Yeah. But, you know, you, you have a lot of hits, right? And uh, if you have like a web server, like there's a lot of people trying to attack you all at once. So um, if you can automate some of that security or security testing or even just like check for best practices mm -hmm. i think that's that's great um it can help uh just make the world more secure yeah i mean what you don't know you don't know so I, that's right this definitely gives you some peace of mind if you can run it on your website and then have it spit out some recommendations or uh, threats that it finds design practices uh that it suggests that would make me feel a lot better about this website. yeah i think so uh I mean, I'm sure it's not, you know, maybe as good as having like a professional security firm do a full penetration test on your uh, website, but this sounds like a really good alternative and, um, you know, it could just make sure that you are able to get all the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think they're using ChatGPT behind the scenes. Um, they, I forget exactly how they work. Um, one of the examples has you enter your website's uh, list of domains um, and it'll like try to crawl that domain, um, call all the different actions on that uh, website, 
Um, if you have authentication, you can pass in some credentials. Um, but I think they also have some kind of a, an IDE plugin that runs through your code base, is able to uh, understand the code itself and the security implications of that code. It seems, it seems pretty cool. That is cool, yeah. They have a free trial if you want to check it out. Nice. All right. So, so what's next? Yeah, the next one is diffusedrive.com. So I, I guess this one is technically Gen AI, but uh, I, they focus on generating high fidelity synthetic data for the vision AI use case. Very niche. Uh, yeah, I mean, very niche. Um, but autonomous driving was a uh, big um, craze a few years ago. Um, and I think a lot of companies did try to use synthetic data to create environments and like game engines. So the self-driving car or the model could understand how to uh, deal with certain novel situations and just get a lot of training video data. Um, so I think this was uh, in, I don't know what you would call it, like the previous wave of vision-based AI models. But I guess there's a lot of uh, need for these these kinds of companies even now because it's not just um, self-driving cars but drones uh, now you have robotics Roomba vacuums uh, maybe like more humanoid robots come into the market so is the idea that this company would just make a really deep like a realistic simulation of the world um I'm not exactly sure how to do it but they claim to do 100x more data um uh, only relevant visual data when you need it at no additional cost. Huh. They have pictures of uh, real-world use cases, um, aerial shots, uh, ground-level street view shots, uh, things that have like uh, fine segmented uh, outlines around the trees, cars, uh, the lanes, etc. Seems like they, they give you very high-fidelity training data for vision model. Okay. Okay. So I bet these guys could make really great video games. If, uh, <laughs> if the whole self-driving car thing doesn't work out, they could probably have like awesome open worlds that well, you could explore. Uh, I, I don't know if these people make uh, synthetic data from video games. They might be using diffusion models to create these. Yeah, but they could use that to create video games, right? Not necessarily from video games, but just imagine that. You had a, I think, how cool would it be if you had a hyper realistic world where, like, think like Grand Theft Auto, but like hyper, hyper realistic, so realistic that you can use it for uh, simulated like self driving cars. I also don't know if they make video data. All I see is uh, static images. Well, I think video is a big challenge. You just need like 60 images per second, <laughs> and then you got video. Next one um, on the topic of uh, creating images is puppetry.com. Puppetry is the easiest way to tell stories with faces. It's the tagline on their website, and they have an app on the App Store. They have close to a million images generated, um, over 50,000 video makers, over 160,000 videos generated. Um, so it's Looks like a DID. If you've ever seen that tool, where you, no, what is that? Where you give it a picture of a person, and it can animate that, have it uh, say a sentence, have, have it animate the mouth and lip movements to be in sync with what it's saying. Is that used for making deepfakes? It can be. Yeah. Like, uh, did you hear about that story where I think it was like the last week or two? Somebody went on like a conference call with their oh, yeah. CFO and all of like the people in finance, and they're like, yeah. in Hong Kong, right? They got away with the twenty-five million dollars. Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, we we need the money for, I don't know something, and then like the guy wired twenty-five million off. Oh, yeah. um, so yeah. they they defake the entire company's exec or C-suite level team. Yeah, and I'm like, like this guy believed that uh, the CFO or CEO, <laughs> they were all. Asking him to wire twenty five million dollars. <laughs> like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll sign right off on it. Oh, that's that's horrible. Uh, 
I guess like for that, you're going to, you know, that that's just uh, gives a better reason for why we need like good, strong public key cryptography. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, just whoever you're talking to, you're going to have to like validate it with your private key. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, that would solve that problem. Honestly, I was thinking about that. Build a tool where you guys can have an app, um, an authenticator app where you click verify at the same time. And you're able to authenticate that the person you're talking to is the person that you want to talk to. You know, I think that's really important. You want to build something like that? We can. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be, that'd be fun. That sounds like a fun, like, weekend project. Um, yeah, but uh, the puppetry isn't uh, as high fidelity. Uh, I think they were focusing on entirely AI-generated stylistic images. Well, actually, they do have some realistic images on there, in addition to cats and wolves and stuff. Nice. But yeah, I, I think their use case is to tell stories okay. uh, with faces in uh, classrooms and social media, create content that's uh, more engaging, short-form content. All right. This is the last AI, generative AI uh, startup that I that I saw at the 500 Startups Demo Day. Reverie. Travelreverie.com. All of your TikTok mapped for you. Um, so their pitch was, most Gen Z folks see or get travel recommendations not from um, Expedia or any of the old school travel blogs. They get it on TikTok, Instagram, um, short form video, images and they're trying to categorize and scrape travel recommendations from social media um, and Jenny Jenny Ipar comes into play when they create um, these little cards um, with specific uh, places and scrape their reviews and give a short recommendation snippet about uh, why this is relevant for you yeah, I mean, I think something like that is is pretty cool. Um, I think that it would be something that I would consider using uh, if I was trying to find an itinerary of different uh, places that I wanted to go to. Um, so let's imagine I was going to go visit, I don't know, say, Chicago. And uh, if I wanted to visit Chicago, you know, I... Yeah, have like a rough idea. I might want to see that. What is that thing called? The the bean. Hmm. Like, and uh, maybe I want to see Navy Pier and uh, uh, Sears Tower. Yeah, it's uh, the Willis Tower now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I should know this. So, anyways, you know, all all these things. Uh, maybe look at the Great Lake Michigan. Um, I think it's Michigan, right? Yeah, you remember it. Yeah. Anyways, all of these uh, wonderful, wonderful things uh, in Chicago. Yeah, uh, eat a eat a hot dog, eat dish pizza, all, all the good stuff. Yeah, I, I guess you can uh, just look up the best things to do in Chicago and probably find this. But um, so I'm going through their flow right now, and um, what is slightly different about them is uh, you can specify what kind of activities you're interested in, like uh, food, nightlife, museum, shopping, and then you say uh, what uh, what aspects of the experience is most important to you. Off the beaten path, you want something aesthetic and Instagrammable, or culturally authentic, or younger travelers. Then it takes all these preferences um, and then gives you a suggestion. I'm looking at uh, recommendations for Kyoto, and it has the. Uh, have you ever been there? I'm in Kyoto, yeah. So it suggests uh, the Nishiki Market, Otagi, Nenbutsuji Temple, World Kyoto Club. <laughs> Kimchi, uh, Kichi Kichi, Otagi, Nen, Wutsuji Temple, World Kyoto Club, Kichi Kichi Omurais. And so we select three studios. of those and hit continue. Yeah, I don't think I actually did any of this stuff. <laughs> I, I I lived in Tokyo, okay. uh, but I've only been to Kyoto once. Okay. Any of these stand out to you? No. Uh, oh, actually, I think I saw the Bamboo Grove when I was there. Well, if you'd use this tool, maybe you could have found out about these uh, hidden gems. <laughs> You know, they're not so hidden gems. If, uh, everybody can find it. Uh, everybody on TikTok. If you're not on TikTok, uh, 
much. Actually, I don't have a TikTok account. Yeah, I should get one. Yeah, that's the last one we have today. Okay, cool. Well then, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Until next time.